screen, uh, just so folks are aware. Um, there is a chat box, so I ask that if you have any questions, you put those questions into the chat box. We're going to have a presenter, they're going to give their presentation, and then we're going to have questions for that specific presenter afterwards. Um, we love to answer your questions, and also we just don't have all of the answers. Uh, it's something that we're working towards. So if you have a question that we can't answer, we might just email you later, um, but just put your questions in the box, the chat box, and then I will ask them to the presenter when we are done. Um, and so with that, um, I am going to mute myself and I'm going to hand it over to Scott. We have three presenters today. We have Scott Brooks, who's our plant inspection supervisor. He'll be talking about imports and exports, you know, in and out of state. Um, we have Rebecca Weber, who is our senior international trade specialist, and she'll be giving folks a lay of the land as far as international marketing and what that program does. And then we have an update from our food safety program manager, David Smith. So lots of interesting information out there. I am going to uh, take a step back and hand the floor over to Scott, our plant inspection supervisor. And thank you all to who are here and thank you to our presenters for all this great information in advance. All right, here you go, Scott. Thank you, Trisha. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, during my presentation, I'll be turning off my video feed to preserve bandwidth so that you can see my PowerPoint. And then after the presentation, I'll turn my video back on for questions. And so right now, I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint. Share that with you. Can everybody see that? Yes, I see. Yep, perfect. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Brooks. I'm a supervisor with the Plant Services Program, and I cover Western Washington. I have five inspectors under me, uh, based from Seattle to Vancouver. And I'll be talking to you today about export of hemp. And it's a new commodity for us to certify to other states and foreign countries. And we're just figuring out a lot of it right now. Uh, my talk will be on one aspect of the export process, namely certification for pest and disease freedom. And Rebecca will be talking about uh, export marketing and other export topics. And just to uh, review, for those of you that may not have been with us last week, uh, the plant services program of which I'm a supervisor and what we do, we are responsible for nursery inspection throughout Washington state at over 5,000 licensed nurseries. We have 10 nursery specialists that inspect at growers and retailers uh, ensure that plants imported into the state are in compliance with our quarantine standards and making sure that all those plants sold in Washington are free of pests and diseases. And so we've got 26 plant health quarantines that we enforce. Uh, just an example of a few of those that we're looking for, pests that we're looking for are plants, uh, Phytophthora remorum, Japanese beetle, uh, Xylella fastidiosa, uh, grapevines, and Japanese knotweeds, other knotweeds. We also have plant certification programs that we're involved in. We have nine, and these are programs uh, set up to offer virus certified stock to our growers, people that are in the fruit tree industry, the grapevine industry. So as they're setting up new vineyards or orchards, they have access to clean plant material. And so we do the inspections and certification for that. There's multiple layers there with testing and certification. And the other big thing that we're involved in is export certification. 
And this takes a lot of our time. Uh, last year, we issued over 30,000 phytosanitary certificates. And annually, we usually certify over a billion dollars worth of commodities. And it sort of depends on the area of the state where the inspector is based uh, and what they are certifying to other countries. It could be hay, it could be logs, it might be fruit trees or grapevines. And we've just started to certified hemp. Uh, recently, we've certified hemp seeds, tissue cultures, and dried flowers so far to two different countries. And just a note here about my talk about export certification of hemp. Uh, the WSDA plant services inspectors are only verifying pest and disease freedom. That is our main focus. And so that's just one part of the total picture for export of hemp. And other state and federal requirements for hemp must be met, and they are the responsibility of the growers to complete prior to the export process. So that might include registration, licensing, THC certification. And I also wanted to mention that this talk is only focused on hemp that is grown in Washington. Uh, if there's hemp that's being brought in from another state and re exported, it gets kind of complicated. So I'm just addressing. Washington grown hemp only. So what is phytosanitary certification? The word phytosanitary means plant health, and that basically equates to freedom from pests and diseases. And so a phytosanitary inspection may be required by an importing country or state on uh, plants or plant products, and they are the ones that set up the pest of concern, the pest that they don't want uh, on plants coming into their country. And freedom from those pests is documented on what's called a phytosanitary certificate, and we issue those. And a rejection or a destruction of material is possible at the important country if a phytosanitary certificate is not present and should be. So that's just fair warning. It's important that you, you do your research beforehand, and you can certainly reach out to us, and we will help you. Uh, that's what we are here to do to facilitate trade and export and we want to make sure that you get everything that you need for that. Um, so make sure that you have a phytosanitary certificate if you need one. So what are the requirements for shipping hemp interstate from Washington? Basically, there's two categories and the one that is regulated uh, are hemp plants, cuttings and tissue cultures. So um, this is basically considered nursery stock or propagated material, and it's going to require an inspection certificate for most states. And that material leaving Washington, going to the other state, must be in good condition and free of pests and diseases. And there's some cases where you'll need to meet additional quarantines depending on the state. There are several states that have a quarantine against Washington for brown garden snail. And in general, dried hemp stalks and flowers, uh, as far as we can tell right now, there are no phytosanitary requirements against Washington origin dried hemp material. But you're going to want to check the National Plant Board website for updates and changes. And last week, Benita talked about this. This is the website that has uh, all of the state's regulations posted for. Um, plant imports for their state, and it's a summary of their quarantines. And um, you can see here on this screenshot, there's a whole column that is for hemp regulations. And you can also do a keyword search up above there. If you type in hemp, then you will get a return of all the states that regulate hemp and what is required. And if there's any question, that you have or your customer in another state has, you can always reach out directly to that state. Each of these summaries has a, a plant health official contact that you can contact and ask them um, specifically if there's any requirements that you need to be, if, if that's unclear after reading their summary. So here's an example of Oregon's quarantine summary. And they're telling us that dried hemp is considered a processed product and no additional plant quarantines apply. So you would not need a phytosanitary certificate if you're shipping dried hemp to a processor in Oregon. However, if you have live plants, propagated material, uh, rooted cuttings, then 
Shipments like that would be considered nursery stock and subject to Oregon's current quarantine regulations for brown garden snail, Japanese beetle. There's an example of a phytosanitary certificate uh, for shipping to Oregon. And um, you can see here, it just has the general information about your shipment, uh, where they originated from in Washington, where they're going to in Oregon, the number of plants and uh, distinguishing marks. And then at the bottom, we are declaring freedom from European brown garden snail. And that's telling Oregon that those plants are free of that pest. And that would happen after your inspection. And we also offer a compliance agreement option for high volume shippers and nursery stock. And so they don't have to apply for a phytosanitary certificate after uh, for each shipment. So uh, depending on uh, the, the volume that we see of hemp plants shipping out of state, we could offer this to, to growers as well. And just again, you should not need a phytosanitary certificate for dried plant parts. So now shifting over to um, hemp that would be exported to foreign destinations. This is a little bit more complicated. Uh, just to give you some background, the USDA has authority for export certification of US commodities to foreign countries. And so they set the trade policy with those foreign countries and plant quarantines are uh, set and agreed to uh, in an international model and that that gets filtered down to us here at WSDA and uh, we have each of our inspectors are certified and authorized to do export certification. So we have a license that allows us to go out on behalf of the USDA. We're actually agents for them and we will be the ones that meet with the exporter in the field to do the inspection, to do any testing involved and then to issue the final sanitary certificate. And I also wanted to show you this um, website here. This portal is uh, by the USDA and it's called PSIT. It's a phytosanitary certificate issuance and tracking system. And this is a very key website that inspectors and exporters will use. And uh, so if you're exporting hemp, you will become familiar with this website. This is where you will submit applications for inspections. And this is where we find the importing countries regulation. And also we issue certificates out of this system. So we're, when you're shipping to a foreign country, what might those import regulations be and uh, what would be required? So in general, all those countries are going to require a phytosanitary certificate and we issue those and it's certifying that that commodity is meeting those requirements for the country. Uh, any testing or treatment that may be required is also documented on that certificate. And you may also need an import permit and um, certain countries require this. And uh, it's actually a good idea with hemp being such a new commodity, um, shipped to a new market in a new country, because if you get an import permit, this will tell you exactly what is required for hemp, um, your form of hemp, uh, to enter that country. So there's, uh, it's very, very clear and um, it really helps us here, um, you know, as an inspector issuing the certificate. And so it's, it's a good idea. I would recommend that if there's any question, it's going to detail any import requirements, uh, specific pests that they want freedom from, treatments needed. And this is something that is the responsibility of your foreign customer to obtain and uh, then you would forward that to us. And here's an example of an import permit that we received in December. This is for hemp seed that was shipped to uh, Costa Rica. So you can see that the whole import permit is in Spanish. And uh, so it would be your responsibility here as the exporter in the US to have that translated and then present that to us. And uh, for this particular, shipment there was treatment of the seed that was required and a number of pests that needed to be declared freedom from i see at least one nematode there so that's uh, an example of an import permit 
So finding out the phytosanitary requirements of a foreign country, the best way to do that is contact your WFCA plant services inspector and tell them the country you plan to ship to, tell them the form of hemp that you are exporting, whether that's live plants, seeds, dry plant parts or whatever. And that inspectors can give you a summary of the importing country's requirements and let you know if an import permit is needed. So far, these are the countries that have requirements for help, and there could be more coming on every day. Uh, so they're just a handful there you can see at the top, but many countries uh, do have general entry requirements for any type of plant material. So that's that could be a piece of kiln dried lumber, or that could be uh, a plant that will be propagated in that country. They just want to know that that plant material is free of pests and diseases, uh, any treatments that happened. And so they often require a phytosanitary certificate, just is kind of the normal course of, of importing. And uh, there are some countries that may have no restrictions against hemp. And I think we'll find that out as we go along. And you should check with your plant services inspector for more information about that. So just to give you an overview of what to expect during a typical inspection, these are your responsibilities to as an exporter. Have your foreign customer obtain an import permit if necessary. Submit an application for a phytosanitary certificate on PSIT. Schedule a physical inspection of the commodity with your inspector and allow at least a week of our inspectors are quite busy and especially around the harvest time of the year. And uh, you'll also want to be considering the fact that you're shipping a new commodity and uh, to get that worked out, to get the requirements known and in place uh, and any uh, treatments or testing that needs to happen. You'll want to build that all into your shipping timeline. And you'll need to present 100% of the shipment for the inspection. And so part of it can't still be dried and half of it ready to go. It needs to be 100% ready to go for the inspection. Also, you'll need to safeguard the shipment after the inspection to prevent any pests or diseases from infesting it after the fact. And do not ship the commodity until all testing, treatment, and inspections are complete and you have the issued phytosanitary certificate in hand. And there may be an inspection to shipment time frame to meet. Uh, typically, certificates are valid for 30 days, so that shipment needs to leave the U.S. within 30 days for most countries. Uh, certain countries have a shorter time frame, like Canada and the EU, are both 14 days. Uh, there's a few countries that have 10 days, so you'll want to keep that in mind. And I assume there will be questions about costs associated with the inspection. So I put that here and uh, we work under two different fee schedules. And so if you are shipping nursery stock and you have a nursery license, which you should have, um, if you remember Benita's talk last week about that, inspections for export will cost you $50 per hour. If you uh, are just a hemp grower and shipping dry hemp, that uh, that falls under the non-horticultural rate of 62.50 per hour. We also charge mileage at the federal rate and document fees are charged as well. And there's a small $6 fee uh, for uh, using PSIT that the USDA charges. And uh, you'll be responsible for any testing or treatment costs uh, that may be required as well. So just to give you a summary of Everything here that I've talked about um, exporting hemp. There's more steps involved for hemp uh, for the hemp grower when exporting to a foreign destination. So you'll want to plan ahead and get plenty of lead time. Countries are just now beginning to get phytosanitary regulations in place. There may be testing or treatment required to comply with that foreign import. And you should have good communications with your foreign buyer reach out to your plant services inspector if you have any questions. And our job is to facilitate exports and to help you to ship your hemp product to new markets. And here's a map of our inspector territories so you can find the county that you're located in. 
and contact the inspector. And here's their contact information. And this will be available on the last slide that I'll show here a link. And so if you don't get it right now, you can go to that link. Uh, it's, our, it's the WSDA website and then go to plant health and you will come to plant services and that's us and you can find our inspectors listed there. So now take questions, I'll turn off the uh, PowerPoint and come back to the video. And uh, for those of you that want to uh, jot down my email address or any uh, websites that's there for you right now. And uh, go back to video. All right, All thank, right. You, thank so you so much so for that. That was very informative. Um, does anyone in the crowd want to put a question into the chat box? Do we have any questions? And if you have questions, type them into the chat box. Any questions? So far, none. Let's see. Can we put the first slide up again? You want the, the last slide? Um, it says the, is it first or last slide? Uh, sure, uh, the first slide, which is my introduction, but I'll bring it up again, sure. Oops. Excuse me a second here, I bring it up. Here's my first slide. Is this the one that you wanted? Oh, last slide. The last slide, okay. Sure, hold on a sec. Let me advance these. I can put this into the chat box to this information so that you have it. Yeah, that would be great. OK. Um, I see that Greg Foster has asked if one of the speakers today can provide perspective on anticipated rulemaking. I'm not sure what you mean by perspective. Does that mean timeline or um, a little more detail might help me answer that question? Probably the best answer right now is um, we'll see if David, when he presents, has any insights um, from food safety. I would be the person who would have insights from um, the hemp program, and I have none yet. Um, but if you want to be a little bit more specific with that question, maybe I can help you. Um, but we'll, we'll be talking about timeline, things like that in the coming days. We're still digesting over here. Um, any other questions for Scott in the chat box? Okay, seeing no questions, um, we can move to our next presentation. And if you, oh, one dried hemp. Maybe, Scott, do you have any input on this? When dried hemp is processed into CBD oil or cannabinoid oil, does its situation change for export? Uh, actually, it does. And uh, the more processed that a product becomes, uh, the less likely it's going to harbor pests and diseases. So in general, states and other countries um, acknowledge that. So if you're shipping CBD oil, it's not likely to require a final sanitary certificate at all. If you're shipping dried flowers, it probably would be. Um, so just, you know, you can ask us, and that kind of depends on, uh, you know, the level of processing. And uh, we can we can do what we need to to verify that with the important country or state to see if you would need a certificate. What was the link to verify if there are export requirements of dry hemp to another state? 
That is the National Plant Board, and I will put that in the chat box for everybody. Great. Okay, Cindy, put it there. Great, great. Any other questions? PCIT yeah, link to. That box as well. Okay, looks like we're going to provide all the links. Um, <laughs> anyone else with any further questions? Okay, if you come up with any more questions, feel free to email them um, to Scott or and CC hemp at agr.wa.gov um, and we can still answer them. Um, Moving forward, our next presentation is from Rebecca Weber. Rebecca, are you with us? I am here. Okay, and Rebecca is our Senior International Trade Specialist, and we're going to learn about the program. And um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for being here. Sure, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll see if I still have Teams when I do that. I always feel like it always goes a little wonky no matter what you do. Okay, so does that come through well? Yup, yup, I see your PowerPoint, looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm like, just uh, tech check. Um, so I'm Rebecca Weber and I am with the uh, WSDA's International Marketing Program. I am in Tri-City, so I get to have the fun um, background behind me just so you can get a feel for where I am and not think that I'm in Olympia, but that's okay if you think that too. You can think whatever you want to think. But um, anyway, so I, I want to talk a little bit today about the just kind of the export picture, which quite frankly is you know, this is all very new and we know a few things, but there's a lot of things we're still learning. We're still um, that are still developing both here in the US, obviously, but also in other markets. And then I want to talk about resources to help you with export, exporting, um, trying to answer questions that you might have in terms of if you're trying to figure this out for your company or trying to incorporate this into your business plan, where do you go? Who do you even ask? How do you get information? How how do you figure this out? Um, so I just want to start with what kind of what we know right now or the information that we have as regards hemp. So really there are two what we call HS codes the with the harmonized schedule. Um, for hemp that are um, the codes through which we're able to collect data about hemp. So last year, 2020 actually, um, hemp seed got its own HS code and otherwise it's aggregated in with a lot of other oil seeds with the exception of soy. Um, so that's the code. If you so happen to be shipping hemp seed, that's the code that you need to put on your export documentation. Um, the other code that we have is true hemp, and that is 5302, and that includes um, true hemp, raw, rutted, um, and then other. So all those kinds of things that are hemp, hemp um, would go under that code. So there's a lot of other codes that would be things like, uh, let's say, a supplement product that includes some kind of a hemp ingredient, um, a, a lot of other things that might not be strictly hemp. Um, one of the challenges with looking at export data is that we might know what code to write on the documentation. It might be aggregated with a variety of other products so that we, you know, we know what information to give as we're shipping the product, but to look and say, can we say for certain within this code that it was this product or within this category that it was hemp? Um, for those things where hemp is aggregated with other products, we can't do that. So these are the two categories where we know it's hemp if we look at the export data. 
So this is the hemp seed data and last year 2020 was the very first year that we saw hemp seeds obviously because the code is new otherwise it was aggregated um, also because this code is a 10 digit code we don't have state data for it we only have us data um, this is thousands of dollars so as you see it's a fairly small you know it's it's not big value yet it's obviously we all know it's early stages for um, hemp exports, hemp product exports, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, you know, sort of so far as we begin this, um, you know, what do we know? Where are things going? So that's hemp seed. And then this one's a little bit busy, but this one gives you a sense of on, on the um, true hemp, the total, again, this is, um, this is U.S. dollars. Uh, so again, not, you know, not big, numbers but you know in total five million dollars that's you know it's not nothing um and then the two the last two columns are just through february of this year so the 2021 looking at a comparison to 2020 um, but this starts to give you again a sense of where our um, products going and what states are shipping them um, interestingly washington does not fall on the list as of yet and we did come in for a small, a very small shipment in 2014 that I thought was kind of interesting because we didn't really have a salvage hemp program so much at that time. So I don't, you know, I can't say what that was, but um, you know, this just, just kind of start to put things in context of who's, you know, where are things moving from and where is it moving to? And one other thing I'll say about the um, export trade data is that this is port of export data. So this is anything that ship, the shipment originated from these states. So it's possible that the product was grown elsewhere, um, but the shipment, the product originated in shipment from these locations. So what do we really know about hemp exports so far? Um, just, just again, kind of big picture. Um, one of the things you know that we know for certain is that different countries have different definitions of hemp. So I, I want to mention here, for instance, as an example, here in the U.S., the definition of hemp is it has to be 0.3 or less uh, delta 9 THC content. In in the EU, for instance, the definition of hemp is 0.2 or less and so you have to always be very careful about what you think the situation is for the product here and what the situation is for the product in the market that you're going to i think somebody uh, needs to mute i'm getting a little bit of feedback um yeah what i'm going to do rebecca is i'm going to mute everyone so then if you can just unmute yourself okay Okay, thank you. Um, so then kind of following on to that, of course, there are different legal and regulatory frameworks, you know, not just the definition of hemp itself, but the requirements for what can enter the country, what documentation is required, the things that Scott was talking about with regard to, um, you know, what documentation do you need? Do you need a phytosanitary certificate? Um, do you just need the fit for commerce certificate? Do you need a certificate of origin? Does the importer need an importing permit? All those kinds of rules and regulations, all those kinds of requirements are different depending on the market that you're shipping into. Um, of course, some markets still don't recognize or acknowledge hemp as a, you know, as a essentially a legal legitimate industrial substance um, other places do and are happy to receive it so you want to be very careful about where you're shipping and and so the guidance that we would give to anybody is make sure to follow the rules and regulations for the country where you are shipping the product to so of course you have to follow the u.s rules and regulations in terms of producing the product um, but because we don't have there there's not a requirement for um, like an export 
permit or anything like that for hemp because it's considered legal for commerce. So you don't have to worry about that. Obviously, you have to have the um, you have to have it tested and you have to be able to have your um, certificate showing that it is, uh, you know, fit for commerce legal to be sold as hemp in the U.S. But um, other than that, the rules and regulations you really need to focus on are those of the country where you might be trying to ship the product to. Um, one of the things that we're really seeing, all of those things are really evolving now, much like they are here in the U.S. So some markets, for instance, I know Canada is a place where um, folks were doing some good business recently. Unfortunately, it seems that um, some of the things there with the, their adoption of their uh, cannabis rules has really aggregated hemp with other kinds of cannabis. And so therefore, it's created some more complexities to the ability to ship product to Canada at this point in time. So, you know, that's not to say that will always be the case, and it's not to say that it can't be navigated, but just because you were able to ship something previously doesn't mean it's going to work exactly the same way tomorrow. So always be thinking about, you know, always be double checking and most importantly, check with your importer to make sure they're going to be able to get the documentation and meet the, you know, be able to meet the requirements for what they need to be able to clear the product and get it into the country. Because whenever you're trying to export things, of course, the most important thing is you can get it in the country, they can have it cleared and received, and you can get paid. Um, my my uh, segue comment is that resources are also evolving. And so with that, I'm going to shift just a little bit from talking about the um, kind of rules and checking with the importers and, and that sort of thing to resources available to companies um, for assistance with export. And of course, when, when I'm looking at export, we're looking at not out of state, but to another country. Um, often we say overseas, but it could also be Canada, you know, Mexico. Um, so just shipping, selling, uh, commerce with an, another country. So the WSDA International Marketing Program, um, we are part of the director's office actually, and our real focus is to work with Washington state companies to help those companies export their products. So do business with, with other markets. Our mission is to help companies really have a health, um, health and viability of Washington's food and agricultural business. And a lot of what our focus is, is on facilitating buyer-seller connections. Um, but we also do work with companies to help, just help companies get resources and understand the processes um, for export. We do, really have we typically we're working mostly with small to medium sized businesses and we work pretty much across all food and agricultural products in the state and beverages um, and then we really have three parts of our program we have export development which is focused on providing resources to companies to really help them become export ready then we have the export assistance side which is really focused on matching buyers and sellers um, we'll do a lot of trade activities so outbound trade missions um, inbound trade missions where we'll bring buyers here to the state. Um, sometimes we'll do other trade promotions, um, trade shows, all those kinds of things. Often those types of activities are funded not with state funding, but with federal funding that comes to us through our trade association, which is the Western U.S. Agricultural Trade Association, which means we're collaborating with other Western states to be able to implement those activities. And I'll talk about them just a little bit later on. Um, and then the third prong of our, or third leg of the stool of our program is market access. And for that, we're doing a little bit on government to government and trade barrier mitigation. But typically on that front, we would be working, um, really it would be the director advocating on behalf of Washington um, Food and Agriculture. And we would be working quite often with the governor's office or USDA or, you know, other parts of either state or federal government to really advocate on behalf of Washington interests. 
Um, so I've got a few slides. I've got kind of some extra slides in here thinking in terms of providing the slide deck to you so you'll have resources for for later. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through the next few slides here. Um, Julie Johnson is in Olympia for us and she really heads our export development um, side of our work. So a lot again on on that really helping companies get ready to export. So export training, um, providing resources, um, often it's trade data. So it's, you know, sort of what does that look like? It's helping companies develop an export plan and all the kinds of questions that you might need to ask yourself if you're thinking, does it make sense to me to think about actually not just selling in the state or in a nearby state, but looking at a market in a different country? Um, export assistance is myself, um, Zachary Garza, who's in Othello for us, and um, Elisa Dawn, who is in Seattle. Um, and we really focus on a lot of technical assistance, so assistance directly to companies. Again, with a little bit of information market intelligence, that kind of crosses over both sides of our program. Um, we get into just trying to help companies understand what documentation is required, um, things like this, speaking to folks and, and trying to help educate about really how to approach export and, and how to make your plan and, and how to connect with buyers and what's good positioning for your products and those kinds of things. Um, again, the trade activities and, and buyer seller matchmaking. Also on the export assistance side, and we have just recently gone through the process of um, essentially reworking our overseas representation. So we have in-market representatives, now six different entities that we work with. So we have South Korea, Vietnam, um, other parts of Southeast Asia, which are Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines. Um, we have Japan, China, and Hong Kong, and Mexico and Central America. Um, these are folks that we have relationships on essentially a contractual basis in those markets. They're there as a resource for Washington companies. Um, we work directly with them to help either get information specifically for companies, help, we can do a little bit of market research, we can help look at what are trade barriers, what are market access requirements, all those kinds of things um, for companies. So sometimes it might make sense for you to work directly with one of these folks. Sometimes you might work through us. Typically we'll make an introduction and then at some point there's a little bit of a handoff and you might work more directly. But that's just a resource that we have. Um, essentially it's a free resource. It's it's for it's free for companies. It's you know paid for obviously by Washington State, but it it's a great resource that can really help companies really position their products and and figure out does it make sense to export is it you know how do i do it where do i put my products all those kinds of things so so we're really pleased about that and then um, we also have three other markets that right now we're doing some consultations with it's a much smaller um, relationship that we have with those three markets which are um, taiwan the middle east and uh, South America. So that is not the same robust set of services that we have for these six locations. But right now we have just done a series of webinars with those three markets, just getting uh, providing information on really what is the picture of those markets. And then um, again, we'll be doing company consultations, one on one 30 minute consultations for companies who have an interest in that market to try to see um, you know, does it make sense for that market? Or if you have a specific question about those markets, that's an opportunity. Um, so this just shows the things I talked about. What are the kinds of things that our in-market representatives can do? And market access we talked about. And again, that's quite often um, collaborative with, with other entities. Um, our market assignments, again, this is more kind of a resource for later, but I am under the auspices of field crops. Um, I guess I probably should add hemp specifically now because I'm the person on our team assigned um, 
product wise to cover hemp. So we also do split by uh, market focus. So each of us have both a market focus and a product sector focus. And so we do a lot of crossover, a lot of working with each other. Um, but for hemp, I'm, you know, you can consider me your first point of contact if you're looking for information or resources. Um, we do work a lot with other partners and industry associations. So I've been, um, I'll say, doing a bit of work, a lot of communication um, with I, I Hempwa, the Industrial Hemp Association of Washington, um, is one of the groups that that I personally liaison with um, off and on. Um, but you see a lot of different folks that that we collaborate with. And and really also I should mention other parts of WSDA. So we really cross over, you know, we've got today, um, Scott talked about plant services things and, and um, we'll hear later about food safety, but we really have to, by nature of the work that we do, work with kind of all parts of of WSDA. So a lot of times if you contact us, we might be referring you out to other folks, out to other parts of WSDA or other entities who might have the information that would be what you're trying to look for. Um, I want to mention briefly the Western U.S. Agricultural Trade Association because this is our trade association and the way that we receive USDA funding, federal funding, to be able to implement a lot of the trade activities that we do. So WSADA covers the 13 Western states plus American Samoa of all places, um, but they have the Global Connect program, which is the kinds of activities that I talked about. But what's also interesting for companies, and we have gotten confirmation that hemp is officially, I like to say back on the roster, but um, on the roster, with the new hemp program, hemp products do qualify for um, Global Connect and the Fund Match program. So there, there is an application process and there's a vetting process. So depending on product content, there could be, um, you know, there could be a reason why certain products don't qualify. So I don't want to say, you know, Rebecca said everything qualifies. It, de it really depends on the content of the product. Um, but as long as your products are at least 50% U.S. origin, um, the fund match program is a great way to, it's a, uh, you know, one-to-one -one matching program. You spend, it's reimbursable, you spend the funds up front, but it's a great way to get uh, essentially 50% of your marketing spend back. Um, I want to mention some other folks here in Washington that we work with quite often. Um, the Washington Export Outreach Team. There's the Export Finance Assistance Center of Washington, which is what we finally call EFAQA. Um, XM Bank is a group that we work with. They do have an office um, here in Seattle. They have a person here, U.S. Commercial Service, the U.S. Small Business Administration, Washington Small Business Development Centers. We work with quite a bit and Washington State Department of Commerce. So those are just other folks here in the state who have lots and lots of resources for export, um, export assistance, helping with establishing a business plan, a marketing plan, getting other resources, trying to, you know, get trade data and just understand, okay, I'm thinking about exporting. How do I do it? What, you know, what do I need to know? And we, we always say we operate on the no wrong door policy. So if you don't know who to call, call me, call any of these folks, and they'll try to channel you to the right resources. And this is just some of what they do. I want to mention the U.S. Department of Agriculture because they are a very strong partner of ours. Um, they have 94 offices in 74 countries, but they also cover some additional countries. So in markets where we don't have Washington state representation, we would typically work through the USDA system. So if you call and say to me, I'm trying to understand how I can get this kind of hemp product into the EU. Well, we don't have a trade rep for Washington in the EU, but I would reach out to the USDA folks who are operating there. Um, and then they have some other resources. But I specifically wanted to mention the export um, analysis information and that's available through the FAS website 
Um, and there's two ways to do it. There's the gain report. So if you're on the fas.usda.gov and across the top, the, the screenshot that's here is from the data and analysis link. And then over here where it says um, in this very top box, you can click on there and it allows you to search. And if you just type in hemp, you get a list of all kinds of reports that are available for hemp. And right now there's at least 14 reports and it it looks at like if you look at the Hong Kong report, for instance, it will give you kind of a sector report of what is the picture of the market, what's happening, a little bit about what the rules and regulations are. Um, you know, can you ship there? Can you not? What are the current requirements essentially? And and just gives you a, a, a little bit of a background on the market. And that is the case for all of these. Germany, um, trying to remember what all ones there are. There's China. Um, for those folks, we had somebody interested in um, shipping seeds. Sometimes there might be a seed report. There's not a hemp report for every market. But right now there are quite a few available, so that's a great resource. Um, here are some additional links, and again, this will be in the, um, you know, it'll be available later. But I wanted to mention on our WSDA website, we do have our database of companies, which is a place that companies are are able to um, be listed. But we also have our events and activities calendar that talks about upcoming. Um, either trade activities or if we're going to be having market education kinds of opportunities, those would also be listed on our um, events and activities calendar. So that's just good to, to take a look at that. Um, and then just a few other things, export.gov is a great resource for all kinds of things export related. If you're trying to figure out, again, rules and regulations, tariffs, um, or if you're just trying to understand about exporting, like how do you even ship stuff? How do logistics work? Um, all those kinds of things, export.gov is just a great resource for kind of all things export. Um, one of the best things that's on there is their basic guide to exporting, and it just kind of walks you through how does it work? Um, a lot of times we will work with the quite often the Export Finance Assistance Center. Um, they've been doing a lot of export training and we'll collaborate with them on that. So that, you know, would be outside of this. But that's another good resource. There's just all kinds of, um, you know, all kinds of resources out there if this is something that you're thinking about. And then I wanted to give a real quick mention of our regional markets program. Um, so WSDA has the regional markets program. Their primary focus is on small farm direct marketing. They run the farm to school program. Um, recently, they've been doing some on farm food safety training, a lot of education and outreach. They primarily focus on small growers, um, small producers, a lot of focus on folks who are small growers who are trying to add some kind of value added component um, to their operation. And so they're just another resource, again, not on the export side, but in terms of, um, you know, marketing assistance and resources for companies here in the state. Um, and that's their contact information. And if anyone has any questions, that's our whole team all together. Um, I would be very happy to take any questions. And yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. That was awesome. Lots of great information. Um, I see that we do have two questions in the chat. I think the first one, it says, what costs are involved with the required certification? Is it a one size fits all concept or are there individual costs to, depending on the specific certifications required? Um, I think that was for you. I'm not, that might. That might have been for Scott. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I wonder if that's more of a Scott question. I don't, Scott, does that, does that fit in your, 
Yeah, I can speak to that if it's uh, if it's about a phytosanitary certificate. Uh, so uh, yeah, it would be fifty dollars per hour if you have a nursery license. So you're shipping plants. It would be sixty two fifty per hour uh, for a non horticultural plant inspection, which would be everybody else. There's going to be document fees, and it will vary on your location and the proximity to one of our inspectors. Um, so there's a few factors to take into consideration there, but my guess would be a typical inspection would cost anywhere between $100 and $300, but it will vary. Okay, thank you, Scott. And so the next question is back for Rebecca. It's why not Canada for in-market reps? So we actually have, we're looking at Canada and we did a lot of, um, I'm going to say we got proposals from Canada and just because of a variety of factors, we ended up not establishing a contract in Canada. Um, part of it was because of the firms, not that there aren't firms, but just trying to figure out, okay, which which markets can we work in and who's going to have the right kind of expertise for the kinds of things that we are going to be wanting to have somebody be able to provide assistance for. Um, so the other thing in Canada is we actually have a very good relationship with uh, USDA. The Foreign Agricultural Service has a, has a couple of offices there. And we have some pretty good relationships with their staff there, their marketing specialists. Um, so that is a resource that we would typically work with um, there in Canada. And then also um, USADA, who, as I mentioned, is our trade association. They have a representative that they work with in Canada. So that's another resource that sometimes we can tap into as well. Okay, and do you see there's another Canada related question um, about if you've worked with Canada and or Health Canada? So we've done a little bit with Canada. I haven't personally worked with Health Canada. I've kind of read through a lot of their, um, I'll say rules and regulations policies, but I haven't personally worked with their staff. Okay, um, I have from Mark Walker, do you have to hold dried hemp in a clean room prior to shipping? Depends on packaging? Hmm, I might defer that one to Scott as well. Okay, thank you. I'm just reading that now. Uh, holding dried hemp in a clean room prior to shipping. Um, Yes, we would need to see the dried hemp out of the packaging. Um, that would be ideal. So yeah, it would be best to be in a clean room indoors if you can manage that. I think, you know, within reason we could we could see it if it was on a loading dock or something, but um, it should be in a clean environment and then protected from pests and diseases that could reinfest it somehow from the field. Okay, do we have any more questions for Rebecca in the chat box? And I guess as um, if anybody's thinking of some last questions, I just want to, um, you know, again, we'll make this information available. But if anybody is thinking about export, trying to just figure out, okay, which specific markets are open to export, um, you know, please feel welcome to reach out. It, it's, it's, I didn't provide like a chart or something like that because it just really depends on the product and what you're trying to do. And it's, in many ways, it's so early in the process that so many things are very much a case by case basis. Um, but, you know, please reach out and we'll be very happy to try to work with you. And if, you know, again, if I'm not the right person, if it's more of a really, um, establishing the business planning or those kinds of things. It might be the SBDC that would be uh, a better fit for you to work with. But again, no wrong door. Please, you know, please 
don't think, well, I don't know if you're the right person to call, so I don't want to call you. Um, please call or email or whatever is your preferred mode of communication. Oh, the I'm looking in the thing. Someone's asking about information on the fund match program. So that would be available on the Wasada website. So that is um, www.wasada, which is W U S A T A um, dot org. I'll just type it in here. Great. Any other questions for the chat box? Everybody's always shy until I'm like right <laughs> about to move on and then the chat box floods. OK, hearing none. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was yeah, incredibly thanks. informative and hopefully we keep building those connections and figuring it out as we go along. Um, yeah, so thanks for our. Oh. OK, so for our final presentation, we have um, David Smith, who is the program uh, manager for our food safety program. So I'm going to turn it over to David. Great, thanks a lot. I, I didn't prepare a lot of slides today, so we'll just share some uh, screenshots as we get into this. I appreciate the opportunity to give a, give a little talk about what food safety does and what it's going to look like as we get into the hemp space a little bit more. Um, I know there's questions around the Senate bill, and so we'll kind of get into some proposed timelines and thinking on that as well. And again, as you have questions, be happy to answer those as we get into it. I appreciate Rebecca's comment about there's no wrong door to knock on for questions. We believe that as well. So if we're not the people that gets you an answer, we'll find the person that is. And so, you know, here in the agency, we do take that seriously. Um, just an idea of the food safety program so you kind of understand our scope and size. We currently have thir uh, 27 food safety compliance specialists and supervisors in the field. We work in every county in the state, and we also work with our local health partners such as counties and our federal partners at the Food and Drug Administration. We license food processors, food storage warehouses, uh, dairy farms and plants, cottage food processors, which are home-based kitchens, and then we also do marijuana infused edibles, custom meat and poultry, and we will be getting into the hemp extract certification as well. We have somewhere around 3,000 different license holders within the program. And so we're excited and both excited and nervous to get into the hemp space. And we're looking forward to working with the industry on this. Um, to speak briefly about the MIE space, even though this is more... I guess, you know, this is probably more hemp focused. Um, we have been working in the marijuana infused edible space for quite a few years now. We license the processing side of that. So um, once THC is considered an approved ingredient, we, we work with the processors to review ingredient labels and um, review processes to ensure that they're low risk in scope. And so for us, that tends to mean no refrigeration for products, um, nothing that would support bacterial pathogenic growth. And so that that's written in the rule, what products are allowed, um, and we work with our industry to stay within those guidelines. We'll be doing some expansion uh, probably over the next year or so to expand those product scope into shelf-stable drinks a little bit further and shelf-stable fermented foods. And so we'll be working with the industry on that side. As a reminder, hemp CBD can be used in marijuana-fused products, and so there's a path for the hemp processor to go into that space. You know, the, the big impact for us right now is the hemp extract certification, the Senate Bill 5372 that was referenced. Um, and just, I'll spend a few minutes talking through it and what our next steps will be for rulemaking. Um, the intent was, and I'll just read this just so it's, you know, out of the definition, a hemp processor who wishes to engage in the production of hemp extract for use as a food ingredient in another state that allows its use as a food ingredient may apply for the hemp extract certification. And what that'll do is certify the hemp processors compliance with the rules written for Washington inspection and good manufacturing practice requirements. Um, if the industry would be curious and interested in what those rules could potentially look like, I'm going to suggest they look at our WAC 16165, which is a food processor WAC. And um, while we're going into that level of detail, probably with the hemp extract certification, it's a really good idea since we will be regulating it as food with some exceptions. I'll show my screen real quick. I can't. 
And so the one comment in the Senate bill has been consistent that in such until such time as hemp extract is federally authorized for use as a food ingredient, hemp extracts are not an approved food ingredient in Washington state. So there will be a a little subtlety within that certification process that these ingredients can go to states where it's allowed, but it's still restricted within the state. I um, just want to point you back to um, the statements that we've maintained on the website, which are still current and active. Um, we also have our, our statement from August of 2019, which is still active. Um, hemp extracts and CBD are considered equivalent. Um, just, just while we're here, I just wanted to make everyone aware that um, the FDA websites are being maintained and has quite a bit of good information on it. Um, I suggest, uh, and we can share these links as well, as what do you need to know and what about products containing you know cannabis derived compounds including cbd the fda is still actively reaching out for information looking to engage stakeholders and better understand the risks um, you know at the federal level and at the state level there are still unanswered questions about public health so um, we'll continue to follow that and as federal law changes we will absolutely follow federal law as well i just wanted to talk through um, what that hemp extract certification might look like conceptually. And this is real high level. So as I think it was said earlier, please don't say David said this is the way it's going to be. We'll enter into rulemaking process once this becomes, you know, written into law. And we consider it, it'll be a methodical process um, and intentional. Uh, we do have resource demands and resource limitations that are significant. And so we'll we'll keep this moving along with the industry, but can't really commit to a timeline at this point. I think some of the important characteristics of what it would take to be certified as a, under our license, or excuse me, certification, um, personnel practices, garments, the way you manage hand washing, employee health, these are standard food processing um, criteria, good manufacturing practices. So it only makes sense that we would have an equivalent system. Um, requirements for proper lighting, chemical storage, if you're using cleaners and sanitizers for your processes, um, water supply, do you have cross connections, meaning your chemicals and, and water being combined inadvertently, uh, adequate draining toilet facilities, uh, how you store your product. And so all these things will be written into rule. And um, again, you could kind of take a look at that 16165 for a general idea. What we will not be doing is writing rules for processing, process control, or for safety. So um, anywhere you see mention of monitoring of records, that that will not apply since that that part will be left up to the processor. Um, and you know, that's honestly a kind of what food safety has going on in this space. Are there questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? I was looking through the comments. I'm not sure. Hey, David, I have a question. Sure. Um, so CBD is not currently allowed as a food ingredient mm -hmm. under federal or state law, correct? Correct. And is that different in Oregon? Each state approaches that differently, yes. The federal element, of course, stays the same, but every state has approached hemp extracts and CBD very differently. So, so hemp, uh, hemp producers or processors in Oregon may be able to put CBD into some foods? In their state, I wouldn't speak for Oregon, but I know um, some states have. I haven't had conversations with Oregon that directly. Okay. Thanks. We have the question, um, any idea what will happen as CBD research like this continues to be in favor of CBD, although it might require you to read an article before you answer it. Um, 
Do you want to respond to that, David? Well, yeah, I would just, and I'm sorry, I was just taking a look at it. Um, you know, the way it'll work is the FDA will take all the research that's been submitted to them, um, all the public comment, and and they'll be making those determinations. I wish I had an idea on scheduling. I'm, I'm not aware, and I had taken a look through just to see if there's any current information, and it's still, I think they're still just looking for that information. Whether or not that specifically has been um, submitted, I don't know. So it looks like, again, we're getting that question. Has the FDA allowed CBD? Um, edibles again, and thus, is it legal in Washington? Yeah, FDA has not allowed CBD in food products for interstate sales. So that doesn't mean they've, they've taken enforcement priority on it like most agencies they're they're having to look at their their book of work and decide where to put resources and no grass certification would not help um eric so the way we're looking at it, I think once it sounds like, you know, it's moving off the governor's desk and when it does, we'll have 90 days to get started and we'll start that rulemaking process. I, I At this point, I don't have a timeline for those steps. Yeah, and I'll say the same. So um, I'll let folks know that the other part of this is a voluntary registration for hemp processors, which would go through our program, the hemp program. Um, so once it's signed by the governor, then we'll start looking at what that timeline looks like. Um, Let's see, can you confirm your prior comment about CBD and MIE? Um, I would suggest you look at, I can give you a couple RCW sites if that would help. And it's, and I, these are LCB and so that's why I'm, I'm gonna preference that, but it's 69.50.326. As long as it's tested in accordance with um, WAC 114.55.0. One nine zero or one zero nine. I believe that's a factual statement. Any other questions for David? Great. Um, just my email address is dsmith at agr.wa.gov. And so please feel free to reach out if you ever need anything. And I'm seeing another question here. Did I understand that processor classification was only for extraction as opposed to smokable processing and packaging? If we're staying with the extract theme, it would only be for edible products. Um, we don't license smokable products. And this would actually be, you know, th these are intermediate products that are gonna go to another state. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, seeing none, thank you all so much for attending and thank you to our presenters for all of that great information. Um, I'm really hoping that that gives folks some clarity about steps moving forward. And if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, just a final reminder for folks to many of our hemp licenses will expire on the 31st of this month. So if you're looking to renew, just try to get that online application in as soon as possible. We don't have any late fees this year, um, so you can get that application in at any time. Uh, thank you so much for your time and we'll see you soon.